Thank you for tuning in to our podcast, The Top Three, which is brought to you by the History Department of the U.S. Naval Academy located in Annapolis, Maryland. In this show, we'll discuss and debate some of the key turning points, trends, and major figures of world history. We do this with the understanding that history is often a matter of controversy and perspective. Our goal is to explore the varied landscapes and seascapes of the past in the hope of shedding some light on how the present world came to be. In the studio with me, Lieutenant Commander Andy Cox, today are Captain Bob Koo and Adjunct Professor Courtney Spikes. All of us are instructors and lifelong students of history. Today, we're discussing the top three best film treatments of modern history, one of my favorites. All of us have two contenders for the list, and then after everyone's had their say, we're going to narrow the list down from six to three. But to start, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we meant by best film treatments. So what do you guys consider as a good way that Hollywood or television handles history? Yeah, I mean, this is really, uh, this is really the crux of the problem, right? Um, are we talking about a film treatment of a historical event that is a good movie? Or are we talking about something that is a, an accurate or authentic treatment of history, uh, but, you know, might be, might be a horrible movie? Uh, one of the challenges, I think, is that we're, as historians, we like talking about nuance and causation and all of these things that, you know, might translate well uh, in certain venues, but might not actually make for very entertaining uh, movies, right? So is it fair to call something a good film treatment of history if if no one watches it? (laughs) That's so true, Bob. And I think what's interesting, too, is there's also historical documentaries left, right, and center. But we're actually choosing to talk about films. Um, Sometimes they are fictionalized accounts of historic events, or sometimes they are actually actual events that are being portrayed in a fictional way. But they also carry with them a lot of the, uh, as Bob was saying earlier, nuances and information and action accuracy of history. And and for me, I find, you know, in terms of teaching, it's often a great way in for students to have access to something that is, uh, you know, easily digestible and gives them a a taste of something or maybe impeaks their interest and curiosity in learning something further. So on that, how much do you think historical accuracy really matters in these? Because the point of a film or a television show, right, is about the narrative. And at some point, in the tug of war between narrative and accuracy for the television producer or the film producer, narrative has to win, right? But like you say, we're gonna, there are some really good films that aren't necessarily perfectly accurate but do portray or communicate some greater historical lesson. Do you think then, like, is accuracy the gold standard for the historical viewer or does anything else ever matter more? Is it about the education or, or what do you think? You know, I, I think... Um... I think there's a tendency for historians to almost have a reputation as being very difficult people to watch historical movies with. (laughs) Killjoy. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I've even, uh, sometimes I even warn my wife if we're about to watch a historically based movie or TV series about something I might know even a little bit about, you know, I just tell her, hey, hey, I'm sorry, I might be insufferable. (laughs) Um, But, you know, I think the question is, you know, can you get a lesson from something? Is is it okay to to put aside the fact that it's historically inaccurate? I think the danger is if you watch something and you you do believe that it's historically accurate uh, and you think it's you know giving you this lesson about historical truth that not, that isn't necessarily m- meant to give you know you might watch Braveheart and you know enjoy it as a very rousing uh, action adventure but don't then go and start talking about how you you understand the dynamics of like English and Scottish politics in, in the medieval era right? so true so true and I think you know it's interesting because this notion of a documentary is predicated on historical accuracy. But we're talking about films, which are primarily entertainment. And a film doesn't get made unless the producers believe there's going to be an audience for it and there's going to be a market for it. So they have to have, to some degree, this notion of narrative that is going to draw people in, like you were saying, and also be accessible to a wide variety of people, not just geeky historians like us. Yeah. I I like how film can engender or create a lot of interest in a historical period and lead people to history. But if it replaces yeah. history, like what you were talking about, like, you know, people watch, say, 300 and think that <laughs> right, was Spartans right. and, yeah. you know, Persian. <laughs> That's the problem. It can't, right. The moment when the historical film replaces history Right, is, there's no airbrushing in ancient Greece. Yeah, <laughs> among other things. Um, okay, so with that in mind, let's get to the movies we picked. And I, I, I'd like to start with mine. The first one I picked was, for historical accuracy, is Apollo 13. 
So just a, a, a little bit of history here is that by the time Apollo 13 launched in 1970, it was less than a year than when Apollo 11's mission had landed, but already everyone could tell there was broad public disengagement with, oh, it's another moon mission. But that all changed when the oxygen tank explosion put the mission and the astronauts' lives in jeopardy. The director, Ron Howard, based this movie off of Jim Lovell's book, Lost Moon, The Perilous Voyage of Apollo 13, and the remarkable degree of historical accuracy he achieves comes in no small part from not just the book and the astronauts being around to tell their story, but the extensive support from NASA and official resources. Apollo 13 did pretty well. Uh, it was the third highest gross of 1995, and it got several Oscar noms but no wins. The movie remains amazingly close to real life events and the few discrepancies mostly come up around the drama of making things up on the fly when the engineers at NASA were actually a lot more prepared. Some of the dialogue is different. The memorable line, Houston, we have a problem, was actually caught in crossfire between several astronauts in mission control, and it's Houston, we've had a problem. Uh, the NASA teams had theorized and practiced using the lunar module as a lifeboat before the launch. In the movie, it's like, oh, this is something I guess we can do, and actually they had kind of practiced something like that before. Ken Mattingly, the astronaut who's left behind on the ground, and he's in the, in the module doing all the simulations, he had recalled that earlier Apollo missions had simulated training engineers to think of solving the same square peg round hole filter problem that they end up doing. Now, they did develop that quickly during the actual emergency, but it wasn't like the first time they have to come up with that necessarily. The concerns about how much power we have, you know, there's only like four amps difference between uh, what we need and what we've got. That was a real concern, but most of the procedure was actually figured out by engineers and the simulator run was more of a verification of it. In the movie, Mattingly is basically helping them kind of come up with it. The other big discrepancy I thought was interesting was that there's actually no fights between the crew or the flight control uh, engineers. Everybody was basically united in the desire to get these guys home. And that was the biggest disagreement between Apollo 13 members and the director, Ron Howard. He felt like this was kind of needed and it was natural of the moment. This is the moment, you know, of film instead of accuracy here. The other thing that I really liked about this movie for accuracy purposes was the technical miracles they pulled off to show what life in space was like. So obviously they can't film this in space, but what they did was put the actors in the NASA aircraft, a KC-135 they've called the Vomit Comet. And they do this for, for actual astronaut training. They run, they fly this big parabolic route where at the top of the hill, everyone in the cabin is weightless for anywhere from like 20 to 30 seconds. Uh, and you can find on YouTube, there are clips of someone's like filming Bill Paxton and uh, Kevin Bacon throwing a football back and forth. <laughs> and they're like bouncing all around the walls and everything. And then someone calls as the gravity comes back on and everybody like sinks to the floor really quickly. So they did this for months, filming all of the scenes where they're weightless in space in 25 second increments, which you can nice. imagine must have taken like forever yeah. to do. The visual effects team was also pretty busy. All of the footage of the Saturn V launch is recreated. It's not from original footage. And that was so good, it fooled Buzz Aldrin and others <laughs> into thinking they had pulled it from the NASA archive. Wow. That's awesome. Um, and that, my last fun fact about accuracy, Jim Lovell makes an appearance in the movie. He is the captain of the Navy ship that pulls the astronauts out of the splashdown. Anyway, I really liked this one, and, uh, and I liked it for this is the accurate accuracy of events as, as portrayed. Oh my gosh, Andy, that's a great one. And in fact, you bring up the Jim Lovell point, and I wanted to ask you two things. Does the fact that Jim Lovell appears in the film lend more legitimacy to the film? And also, do you think the reputation of a director like Ron Howard, who's so well known and so beloved, also elevate the whole film as well in terms of its legitimacy and accuracy? I think the second mattered a little more than the first. I think having Jim Lovell in the movie is like this nice homage, but it doesn't necessarily add to the accuracy of it. I mean, if it was completely inaccurate, maybe he would have said, I want no part in this. Exactly, and, you know, exactly. Get someone else to be <laughs> Right, 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 right. Um, I do think it is a credit to Ron Howard and the entire crew, and that Ron Howard's kind of directorial weight lends to this project, that this was something that they did a lot of consultation on and a lot of work on, and it met a hearty stamp of approval from many, many players and observers on this. Well, you could tell that Ron really respected the whole story and everyone that participated in it, for sure. 
I, th- I think it's so interesting that the thing you, you pointed out was one of the main points of contention was that there weren't really that many arguments um, between, I think you said, flight control and, and the crew. Um, in reality, they, it, it, it seems like they mostly just work together cooperatively to solve the problem, right? And, and this seems like something that is very common in, in films, right? That medium just requires the injection of more interpersonal drama, more arguing, more tension between, uh, between the various protagonists. Because otherwise, it's just like a bunch of people solving like math and engineering problems together, right? Um, We're at a STEM school. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, right? <laughs> uh, maybe maybe that would make the movie better. But although, although that does remind me of. Um, and the, the Martian, right, which I came out just very oh, recently, I exactly. That movie. And I remember thinking about because the the book, The Martian, uh, is, is fundamentally mostly just um, the, the the personality, Mark Watney, right, uh, solving various math and engineering problems. And, and if I remember correctly, when they adapted it to a, the movie, there there was some more interpersonal drama with uh, the people back home, whether or not they were actually going to go back and rescue him. They they had to spice it up a little bit because you know otherwise, I guess no one wanted to watch. Mark Watney figure out how to grow potatoes man on Mars, Mars for two hours. <laughs> exactly, yeah. True man against nature. Um, let's hear one of yours, Bob. Yeah, uh, thank you. So uh, my first submission is 13 Days. So this is a movie from 2000. Uh, it dramatizes uh, one of the most suspenseful episodes uh, in, in modern history, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962. So, you know, a quick summary for anyone unfamiliar with that event. In early October of 1962, an American U-2 overflight uh, discovered Soviet uh, nuclear missile installations on the island of Cuba, uh, quickly became this whole full-blown crisis. President Kennedy uh, convenes what he calls the Executive Committee uh, XCOM of the National Security Council for the next 13 days, right? Uh, they discuss how they're going to resolve this issue. Uh, members of the Joint Chiefs, parts of the DOD, push for just an immediate invasion uh, of Cuba. But eventually what they settle on is what they call a quarantine of Cuba. They, they can't call it a blockade uh, because technically, legally, a blockade is an act of war. Uh, so they do a little wordplay, call it a quarantine instead. There's various diplomatic backs and back and forth. Uh, you, another U-2 is actually sh- shot down. Um, there's all sorts of miscalculations calculations that seem to really bring bring the world uh, to the brink of nuclear war. Uh, and finally, kind of ends after 13 days, there's a public pledge by the Kennedy administration not to uh, invade Cuba, as well as kind of a, a secret promise uh, that this is a matter of some contention that they were, uh, the Americans will remove the Jupiter nuclear missiles uh, currently based in Turkey. Uh, it kind of ends with the, the Soviets backing down and removing their uh, their missiles from Cuba. You know, this, this is clearly a tense episode and in terms of moments in history on which literally the fate of the world has hinged this is this is definitely up there but i also think this captures part of the problem with dramatizing history because this is kind of actually hard to dramatize this is a this is a very complicated uh sequence of events huge cast of characters flung across the entire world requires a pretty detailed command of some of the nuances of what's going on in the geopolitical sphere in uh, international relations at the time and if you don't have that understanding some of the tensest moments just kind of seem like a bunch of people talking right which doesn't necessarily make for uh for great film serious voices in the oval office and exactly right you know i, I think uh 13 days does does a really good job of overcoming uh some of those flaws while still staying very historically accurate part of the reason why it's able to be so historically accurate is because kennedy actually taped all of these uh without telling anyone he there are these secret tapes that he had in the oval office and a lot of these uh, in a lot of these rooms you know he was someone who was very conscious of history uh one of the ways in which he first became famous he, he published this book profiles of courage talking about various historical historical leaders. So he was someone who was always thinking about posterity. And so he actually taped all of these. And so the movie itself is based on, uh, it's it's called The Kennedy Tapes, uh, but it's an edited volume essentially transcribing some of these and adding the context you need to understand it, written by uh, these historians, Ernest May and Philip Zellico, some fairly preeminent uh, international diplomatic historians. You can see that the fact that a lot of this dialogue, you know, pulled directly from the tapes, a pretty clear uh, historical grounding in what actually happened. You know, there's some there's some liberties taken. One of the main liberties taken is that you know the main character, Kevin uh, Costner's character, is uh, you know special assistant to the president, a guy named Kenny O'Donnell, who in reality actually didn't really play as much of a role 
in the crisis as he actually does. That's that's the main point of contention that a lot of the people who are in the Kennedy administration who have seen it have, have brought up when they saw the movie. But you can you can kind of see why that was a narrative choice, right? Uh, Kenny O'Donnell is kind of a an everyman type figure. Uh, he's not someone who really understands necessarily some of the nuanced details uh, that the, the DOD folks, the Department of State folks do. And so, you know, they can explain the, uh, that stuff to him and then by extension the audience. But a lot of people who have seen it, uh, for example, the former Secretary of Defense, Bob McNamara, um, have said that that's a pretty good portrayal, right, in, in general, of the events that happen. And, you know, I think it's especially relevant now as we start thinking more about nuclear war, you know, especially recently, um, given what's been going on and some of the uh, the crises in Ukraine. I find myself thinking about this movie, and there's a great scene in the movie uh, in which there's this uh, very tense moment uh, in which a Soviet ship is about to challenge the blockade, uh, and the Navy right is is very insistent on following its rules of engagement. You know, is firing at this ship before it stops. Secretary McNamara essentially shouts down the CNO, "Forget your rules of engagement. Like what we are seeing here, you know, is a form of communication. Right? What you're seeing here is uh, is not ships firing at each other. It's President Kennedy communicating with Premier Khrushchev." I remember that scene because he turns to the big board and he goes, this is language, exactly. Admiral. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Some of the stuff we've seen in the news recently about, oh, you know, what what, what, what would this signal to the Russians, or, right? What is what is the implications of this, right? It doesn't come up in the movie, but one of the, one of the actual outcomes of this event is, uh, you know, the installation of kind of more of a hotline. So there is an actual form of communication, uh, which is not something I think we really have now, but uh, th- this, this whole episode has been on my mind recently, so. And not actually a red phone either. Not actually a red phone, exactly. Um, the the accuracy of this movie, I love this pick, by the way. This is a movie that actually taught me some history because I think I saw this, if I remember right, I saw this movie before I really learned a lot of Cold War history. And the idea to me, watching this movie as a younger kid, that we could invade and bomb Cuba over this, right? That yeah. seemed like, oh, that's over the top jingoistic and they're kind of making the generals and the Joint Chiefs of Staff right. out to be like the bad guy. And then learning, no, they really were pushing for this and Kennedy had to take a stand against them. It kind of blew my mind. It really is mind blowing. You, you look at the tapes in the first meeting and it seems like, oh, all right, everyone's agreed. Yep, we're gonna go invade Cuba, right? And you know, talking about a profile in courage, um, you know, John F. Kennedy really did kind of pull uh, pull the, the Joint Chiefs back from the brink in that perspective. So. Which is pretty impressive considering what a young president he was. Absolutely. And you know, you made a point about O'Donnell character played by Kevin Costner being sort of an amalgamation and maybe having a bit more of a bigger role in the movie than he did in real life. Considering that Costner was one of the producers and probably developed the script, it makes right. sense that he would have seen that as a useful narrative device to get through a lot of the historical moments that the general audience might not know. I think it's also interesting that with a budget of $80 million, mostly because of the the top of the line stars, the box office actually wasn't that great. And this is where we talked about earlier about that notion of accuracy versus entertainment. And this film has a lot of accuracy and it's really utilizing the first uh, primary source information from these tapes, yet it didn't necessarily translate it to type of film that everyone just wanted to go see, even though, as Andy was saying, it's a wonderful way to understand the Cold War and to actually have some uh, knowledge and experience with this particular incident. You know, and I found that it it seems like a tenser, more dramatic movie if you understand and take seriously the threat of nuclear war. You know, a lot of people who kind of grew up in the post-Cold War era n- never really think about that as, as a reality, right? As something that people actually lived through thinking might happen. Um, but then when you think about that as the specter that kind of hangs over all of it, um, it, does, it does make it seem a little bit more interesting than just people talking in a room, right? Absolutely. Qu- quick poll on this then. Is this the best Cold War history movie? Can you think of anything that would, not the best Cold War movie, there are way too many to go through, (laughs) right? But like, in terms of accuracy or teaching history, I'm having trouble coming up with a better one than this one in this moment. I, I think I would agree with you. I, I can think of better, maybe better Cold War movies. Um, I actually think War Games is a really good Cold War oh, movie. Oh, I remember because this. Yeah. They're talking about the, uh, the late Cold War mood mm. and then the threat of nuclear war. I, I still think the opening scene of War Games where that um, there's like a nuclear drill that comes through and it's just these two Air Force officers and it starts with them, you know, just average day, right? Drive to work, drink their coffee, talk about their wives and their families and then this nuclear order comes through and they realize that they're about to launch 
launching a nuclear weapon that's going to kill millions of people. And and one of them chooses not to, right? And, and it turns out it's going to be a drill. But that, I still think, is some of the most, some of the best, most suspenseful few minutes of, of film I've ever watched. But in terms of actual, actual raw historical accuracy, I'm not sure I can think of anything that beats 13 Days. Yeah, I agree. I think that was a great pick, Bob. Let's hear yours. All right. So I'm going to take us a little earlier in time. I'm going to take us back to World War I. So for my first film, I selected 1917, which is set the year before World War I ends, which, for people who don't know, runs from 1914 to 1918. And this was directed by Sam Mendes. And the story follows the two British soldiers, Blake and Schofield, who are assigned an impossible task of reaching another British battalion to warn them that the Germans have laid a trap. Now, with communication lines cut, the British have mistakenly believed that the German retreat in spring of 1917 was real. In fact, the Germans were just regrouping to tighten and strengthen their defenses, known as the Hindenburg Line. But the British planned to send several regiments in pursuit of them and were actually about to fall into a trap that would surely slaughter them all. So Blake and Schofield are chosen to warn the battalion of this new information. And because Blake's older brother is in one of those regiments, he's highly motivated to reach them in time. Now, drawing inspiration from epic stories like Homer's The Odyssey or Steven Spielberg's 1998 movie, Saving Private Ryan, the directorial conceit of this film is that it's supposed to feel like one long take that follows our lead characters on their epic quest to reach the British soldiers before it's too late. Director Sam Mendes explained that the origin of the film came out of a story from his World War I veteran grandfather, who repeatedly told him the tale of a messenger who had a message to carry. Now, the plot about the messengers is indeed fictional. What's great about this film, though, is its dedication to historical accuracy about the many types of experiences during World War I. Everything from what it was like to live in the British trenches, often filled with mud and rain, versus the concrete-designed German ones that had electricity and some even with running water. We also get to see Blake and Schofield traverse the dangers and horrors of no man's land, that wasteland between enemy trenches destroyed by years of fighting with no considerable gains. And then that itself is juxtaposed by the beauty of untouched countryside as they walk for miles toward their mission. Additionally, the film depicts the challenges of troop movements, encounters with lone wolf soldiers, and even the use of airplanes. And 1917 interestingly explores the impact of World War I on civilian life, from the devastation of farms and towns to the huddled insecurity of refugees attempting to hide from the soldiers. In one of the most pivotal scenes, Blake and Schofield come upon an abandoned farm where they pause to witness an aerial dogfight. The German plane is hit and crashes into the barn where they are hiding, and Blake, the one trying to reach his older brother, insists that they rescue the wounded German pilot from his burning plane. However, once free, the German mortally stabs Blake, leaving Schofield to avenge Blake's unnecessary death by shooting the German he just saved and confronting the realization that he will now have to complete the mission alone. He is ultimately successful in the film, and we end the film where it began, with Schofield leaning against a tree, trying to rest, while thinking about his wife and daughter back home. So 1917 was a box office hit. It grossed almost $400 million worldwide and achieved one of the director's biggest goals, which was to bring World War I out of the shadow of World War II, which has many more films and TV series available. Critics also applauded Mendez's effort, and 1917 garnered multiple awards, including Oscars for cinematography and visual effects and a Golden Globe for Best Motion Picture. Plus, the British equivalent to the Academy Awards, the BAFTA for Best Film and Best Director. I agree. This was an amazing film when I saw it. Um, the whole technique of making the movie look like one long, uninterrupted cut was amazing. I like that it does what you talked about, about bringing World War I out of the shadow of Absolutely. World War II. And I, I guess I'd ask, what do you think makes this movie so different about any other World War I movie or film or, or, or story we've seen? And is it the soldier's experience part, or, or is it something else? I think that's a great question. The majority of movies are made where? in Hollywood, in the United States. Right. And the American narrative with World War I and World War II is much greater with World War II. So it makes sense that there'd be a lot more production in that area. The Europeans, of course, think back to World War I a lot more than we do. And in fact, they, on Veterans Day, wear the poppy 
right? To right. the poppies of Flanders Field. And that's a symbol from World War I, and they wear it in honor of all soldiers in all wars. I think your point about why is this movie uh, more accessible and why did it do so well, I think, number one, this conceit of making it a single take actually feels a lot like a video game. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's certain oh, segments of the film, like certainly the one where he's in the bombed out town and he's being sort of attacked by soldiers that you see or can't see. Yeah, that was intense. It feels like a video game. So I think that's very accessible to students. It's also in color, which I, you know, I don't <laughs> mean to be dismissive, but right. I think in color helps. And we haven't had a lot of World War I films in color lately. And certainly in English language, there's a lot of um, sort of French and German films about this as well. So I think those are certain aspects of it. Do you think there's been a resurgence of interest interest in World War One as just a historical event recently? Absolutely, because we had the 100th anniversary. This movie came out in 2019, and so I think the 100th anniversary definitely made a big impact. I, I agree with you. I feel like this is something that more and more it has come out from the shadow of World War II. And I think that's interesting, right? World War One is such a pivotal event in modern history. Uh, in many ways, kind of marks the uh, the end of the long 19th century, beginning of the truly modern 20th century. Absolutely. I mean, they start the war with horses and end with tanks. Yeah, absolutely. I think also reaching the like the century mark kind of helps bring it back out. But also, there's been a reinterest in uh, a, a renewed interest in materials from there. Like just a few years ago, Peter Jackson released that documentary where they right, colorized they shall not all grow that. Old. Wooden, that uh, was we should yeah they shall not grow old. Where yes. it's recolorized for price size through that reason, so that it seems more accessible, seems more human, right? That you're looking at people um, that seem more relatable to you. I'll throw out a hot take because why not? Um, yes, do it. You know, I I think it's interesting because. You know, the, the World War One ends one of these first great ages of globalization, right? Going mm -hmm. from kind of the 1880s on, you know, gold standard kind of knits the global economy together. And, um, you know, on the, even on the, on the eve of World War One, there were the people who were saying that the world was so economically interconnected now that there's right. no way right. these people would go to war, right? Trade, the, the, the profits from trade would stop these countries from going to war. And I wonder now as we're kind of, I don't want to say we're in the twilight of a new age of globalization, but we've clearly been experiencing 40 years of um, unprecedented globalization that seems to be coming to, I don't know if it seems to be coming to an end, I can't tell the future, but it seems to be kind of approaching this rocky era. I wonder if that's part of the reason. I mean, obviously the anniversary is important. Right, but I think that's an interesting point, Bob. And I also wonder too, you know, if you look at what happened in World War II with Mussolini and Hitler, those were particular people in that particular moment. And I might argue that Putin is a particular person in this moment. If someone else had been in charge, those economic ties, especially with Germany and the pipeline, right. might have been sufficient to have them give pause to doing what's happening today in Ukraine. Yeah, I think that's a that's an excellent point. And you know, I think people are still arguing about the origins of World War One a hundred years later, right? And I think that's a, that's a good sign that it's a, it's a pretty important historical event. So I, I'm glad it's getting the attention that I think it's due in popular culture at least. So I'd like to move from there, I think this is a great transition point, to go from movies about uh, historical accuracy, and, and, and in this case, movies to accuracy of period, maybe over, over actual events. Because that's at least the movie I pick next, which is one of my favorite historical movies, Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World, directed by Peter Weir from 2003. This is a movie that maybe best captures what being on a sailing warship would actually be like. I would say maybe it's the best naval combat movie ever of any period. I would throw that out there, actually. <laughs> it never actually happened, though. It's based on a combination of a couple books from the novel series by Patrick O'Brien about naval combat during the Napoleonic Wars. O'Brien's books, by the way, have also won a lot of accolades for their historical accuracy as well. The thing that I think makes this movie so good is not just its dedication to the accuracy in details, large and small, but how the actors and the crew and the producers make the audience see and feel and understand what these characters are going through. So the movie is about the British warship HMS Surprise. It's crammed full of men from all origins and animals together in this tight space. And aside from all the dramatic naval battles and the tense surgery scenes dealing with the wounded, we get a, from the very beginning a very good sense of what daily life at sea is like in the age of sail. We see sailors' habits and we listen to wardroom jokes and anecdotes <laughs> and we watch them eat and drink and we see the routines and the duties 
duties of the changing of the watch and of what it's like to handle lines. And we see ship's discipline. We see a guy get flogged, right? We look at the, the superstitions and the beliefs from this crew about a Jonah. And, uh, you know, we, we, we go with them through the howling storms of the Straits of Magellan and we see the stillness of the doldrums. We listen to the bells toll the watch and the creak of the rigging as, they, as the sailors are climbing up and down. And between all of this, between like moments of extreme action, when cannonballs are like splintering the wooden sides of the hull, we also see a lot of tedium. Of like what it's like to be deployed at sea for months. very, <laughs> very offensive. You know, and and anyone who has gone to sea in any period, navy or marine, will tell you. Well, th they will recognize probably like yeah, I feel that. <laughs> <laughs> Russell Crowe, uh, at the time, had a quote where he basically compared the sailors to astronauts. That these are people going on this epic, dangerous voyage and living in a confined space for months at a time, and they're basically riding a piece of wood against the forces of the ocean. And I wanted to talk about a little how they did that. There's this excellent documentary about making it. And they talk about the ways that they shot all these different scenes. So they actually had two period accurate replica vessels, life size. One, an actual sailing ship they bought from Canada. Wow. And then a life size model they built on gimbals in this enormous outdoor tank, the same studio tank that they filmed Titanic in, actually. Oh my goodness. Um, and they designed that one from digital scans of the USS Constitution, wow. which is period accurate, at least, if not from the same Navy. So they would shoot scenes at sea and on the tank in that one vessel, but they also used they're technically miniatures, but the producer who made them called them bigatures because they're <laughs> they're models of these vessels, but they're 30 feet long and like I forget how high. Like they're enormous, uh, and they will like wheel these around in front of blue screens and stuff to simulate the the movement in combat. Most of the shots of crew on the surprise are in life size compartments on shore models or or on the uh, the one on the gimbals in the tank and they reconstructed all the decks the, not just the weather deck but like the gun decks and uh, and the rooms where they do surgery and the captain's cabin and the camera crew like they did this period accurate so the director, Peter Weir, said, I didn't actually make room for any of the camera crews. They have to cram everything they needed in there. And apparently some of them are like wearing football helmets because everybody keeps hitting their heads sure on the beam. <laughs> <laughs> everything is set on gimbals to give movement. Like the set is literally rocking in three dimensions all the time. And then visual effects artists will look at paintings of naval combat from the period. And they're adding in the smoke or the spray of splinters uh, or the attitudes of the ships during combat. Um, they put all of the actors and the crew through a two-week boot camp about f cutlass fighting and firearms and sail uh, rigging and line handling and hand-to-hand -hand combat and how do you repair a leak in the ship and all of that. And the last, the last touch I'll add is when they found out there was a uh, a modern sailing square rig ship going through the Straits of Magellan, where this takes place, a part of it. They sent a crew to be on that ship and filmed the stormy seas as they went through that strait, and then they would use that literally in the movie. And Peter Weir thought it was such an awesome touch to be like, even though the ship the crew is on isn't physically there, that's the actual ocean right. at the time, wow. right? The movie did win a couple Oscars for sound design and cinematography. It had the unfortunate timing to go up in the box office against Pirates of the Caribbean, <laughs> Curse of the Black Pearl, which I would argue is the best Pirates movie. <laughs> but also for Oscars, it went up against Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, Oof. which basically like swept the field. Oof, right? Yeah. Right. Um, but since then, it has slowly and steadily built up a very dedicated audience and reputation in the decades since. Yeah, it's a, it's a great movie, and you know I remember talking to some of the uh, the surface warfare officers in our department uh, about how you know surface warfare in the Navy of all the communities tends to have the tends to be the least chic, right? Everyone loves pilots are cool, uh, you know even submarines are, are kind of cool, right? Um, but surface warfare officers, what we what we hear call SWOs, right, tend to have a bit of a branding problem. Um, but I think of all of all the things that depict how it can be cool to be a SWO. I think Master and Commander is definitely there. I guess there is kind of the tedium, uh, which is which is not great. But in terms of things that um, kind of uh, sell surface warfare, ships, right? Um, you know, aviators have Top Gun, uh, but we've got Master and Commander. It definitely brings the, the, the mystique 
and the uh, the like the values, the nobility of the officer corps right. out of the SWO community for this. And I'm just wondering, when you saw this, were you already on your path towards becoming an officer? When this came out, I was at the I was already a midshipman at the academy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. I love this movie. So did every did all your classmates go see it? And I don't did remember y'all... if everybody. Apparently, not enough saw it, but I did in the theater, and it, it was amazing. Did right. you consider becoming a SWO as opposed to becoming a pilot? Perhaps very briefly. <laughs> 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 but only if he could climb the rigging. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's such an interesting story because, I mean, it's a wealth of information from Conrad's books. I mean, it's just phenomenal. My dad is a huge fan and has read them all. And there were supposed to be a series of movies based upon the books after this. And the movie cost so much money in all the ways you so wonderfully described, Andy, with the recreation of all the sets and all the ships and all the things, right? It costs a lot of money. And so even though it made technically more than it was than it cost, it didn't actually make the studio any money. And so they were unable to sort of green light future projects of it, which is a shame because you'd invested all that capital into creating the sets, why not use them again? There are rumors, uh, even persistent this year and last year, that they are making or trying to work on another one, either a sequel or a prequel. I don't know if it would have Russell Crowe. This is literally 20 years after he made the last one, right? But that they would try to bring this back. Because oh, it definitely great. has, they definitely sense like the market was was hungry for this. Yeah, they, they could reboot it, right? There's been, I God mean, knows not? how many Jack Ryans, Jack Reachers, I guess, I don't know if they're all Jacks, but. Spider-Man. Yeah. Spider-Man, <laughs> Spider-Man. So where can you take us on your next uh, on your next one? Yeah, so this is a, it's actually kind of a good segue. So my next one is, uh, again, a little bit of a, a spicy take. Also kind of breaking the rules because I didn't realize this was yeah. all supposed to be modern history. Are we going to let him get away with that, Andy? I want to hear about this because it, is, it is a favorite of mine too, but go I ahead. I mean, it is on HBO, which is uh, Home box movie office, channel, right? Right? kind of. So, so my <laughs> second submission was the Rome TV series, which aired on HBO from 2005 to 2007. Uh, it's actually a great segue from Master and Commander because, uh, you know, this TV show, uh, it was a joint production between between HBO and the BBC, and it was one of the most expensive TV shows uh, ever made at the time. Uh, so it depicts the final years of the Roman Republic, uh, the final civil war of the Roman Republic between Julius Caesar and Pompey the Great, uh, eventual, uh, Julius Caesar's eventual victory, and then his assassination, and then the rise of his adopted son, uh, Octavian, who will become the first Roman Emperor Augustus. Um, and yeah, as, as I said, this was this was an extremely expensive TV show. Uh, they they built these whole sound stages, basically building whole s- city streets of Rome uh, in, in Italy, actually in the in the famous uh, Cinecitta uh, movie studio in, in Rome itself, complete um, with graffiti and everything. Complete with graffiti, everything. Filming in Italy uh, must have made it easy to cast. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, it was really almost ahead of its time. It kind of came at the beginning of this whole era of prestige TV, right? Uh, nowadays, uh, TV has become a medium that is um, just as just as influential, just as popular, prestigious as, as film is. Sometimes more so, um, especially with streaming, uh, especially after COVID and all of that. This was a little bit ahead of its time, I think, in that degree. Um, and you know, it's almost like a, I, I like to say it's almost like Game of Thrones before Game of Thrones, right? Oh it was yeah, very, yeah. It was very vamped up, lots of violence, lots of sex, right? Uh, and it took, and I think as a result, it took a good deal of historical license with the events themselves. It wasn't necessarily always true uh, to what is described uh, just purely factually in the historical sources. And the reason I'm, I'm kind of okay with this, and I, I'm throwing this in as a, as a choice, uh, is, is for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first off is just for ancient sources, there's just actually a lot you don't know. There's a lot of sources that are very fragmentary, that don't survive. Uh, and so if there's going to be a historical license taken with any event, uh, it might as well be of something that you actually don't know that much about. A lot of those sources are also um, can be quite biased. Uh, there's not necessarily the degree of uh, historical accuracy or a uh, sense of, oh, you have to tell the flat truth. A lot of these writers were just kind of rich, wealthy people uh, who, uh, you know, in their spare time uh, got to write what they wanted to write about, these wealthy senators who had the time to write. Um, and so, you know, yes, there's some creative liberties taken with the events that they describe, uh, but I'm kind of okay with that. And finally, I, I really think that the ambiance it, it nails it, kind of like what Lieutenant Commander Cox was talking about with Master and Commander. They really go hard on just sort of the the, uh, the material culture, uh, even little things like the fact that th- there's there's graffiti, the, the statues are actually painted, right? A lot of people don't realize that 
these majestic white marble statues that we associate with Greek and Rome were festooned with color at the time, right? Um, and so I think that that the material aspect of the ambiance is really special. And then I really think that in terms of the mood, obviously I didn't live in Rome, you know, in, in 31 BC, but the mood, this kind of infighting among the elite, the decline of the Roman Republic. Uh, some people are kind of cl trying to cling on to traditional Roman culture, um, Roman values, but it's kind of falling apart in this vicious power struggle between members of the elite. That, that feels very accurate. And so I'm, I'm reminded of a quote by uh, Tim O'Brien and the things they carried. Uh, it's a true story that never happened. Right. Mm. Uh, he talks about how, you know, when his, his famous novel about the Vietnam War. Um, and so I think maybe in terms of pure factual events, did this happen? Was this person the way that they were describing the sources uh, may not really line up. But in terms of what it felt like, I think in that era, um, I, I think it's pretty, pretty spot on. I loved this TV show. I wish there were more than two seasons of it. Um, I also like, and this is a connection to your other pick here. I really liked how they used to every man yes. in this sense. Like Donnelly in 13 Days, you have Marcus Varinus and Titus Pullo, the two Roman soldiers who cannot die. <laughs> who literally have the greatest plot armor I have ever seen. Um, but who take us through all of these major political events and they're, like, they're basic, every, like Titus Pullo is just a, 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 a dude in yep. the Roman army. Um, and I, I guess I'd ask both of you, do you think a, this is sort of a necessary narrative device, right? A way to tie right. big events and people together for an audience member. Do you think that sort of device is more or less threatening to historical accuracy than other liberties? Or is this like, this is just a price you kind of have to pay? I definitely think it's a necessary device to use because there's no other way for us to help the audience understand the bigger picture if they don't already have previous knowledge. And so it allows them to enjoy the film or engage with the film or connect with the film in a deeper way without having to have read a lot of books like we have uh, to know all the nuances and, and ins and outs on its own. And I do think the, the device of Titus and Varinus is brilliant in this series. I loved this series too. Yeah. I was a big fan. <laughs> I watched it. Um, and it was just, I thought it was fantastic. And I loved the graffiti and all like the messiness of Rome, like the milieu and, the, and really getting a sense of what it was like to live there. I could smell it through the TV. And I think the two characters there really help us dive into a part of Roman history that we don't get to see a lot of, mm. right? And probably related with a lot more of the audience as well. Um, the sort of struggles up and down, not coming in from this high echelon wealthy family, but actually making your way up through the meritocracy and finding opportunities given to you or taken away from you or trying to navigate just sort of, you know, what it was like to be there. I, mean, yeah. I just thought it was fantastic. I absolutely agree with you. And I think it's all the more important the further back you, in time you go, because the further back Back in time you go, the more sources that you have are just elites. Mm. Either they're the rich, or they're the Absolutely. wealthy, they're the powerful. But that's um, all we have. And that's all right. we have, right? And it, But if you want to tell a story about the people who lived in these societies who were not those people, which I think is, is good to do, right? Um, you do have to take some historic license. And I'm doing quotes now that no one can see because of this medium. <laughs> Air quotes. Um, but you do have to take some license to kind of imagine what it was like to in those segments of society that might not have survived in the historical record. Keeping in mind, though, there are some genuine issues with the accuracy as oh, the story right with this. This is a great show, but it shouldn't substitute for, like, I now understand absolutely. how the Republic fell apart. Right? <laughs> it's a great dramatization of it, though. And I yeah. would say it maybe isn't any more harmful than, like, the Shakespearean plays. I don't know. That that would be something I would need to hear from, a like, a, a historian and an English professor about right. this one. Right, right. That would be a great debate. And what I like about this one is I feel like this is one of those historical works that gets people interested enough to go learn more about yeah absolutely which i think is should should hopefully be you know an effective really good historically based uh film absolutely i agree 100 percent, bob i think that's a great point all right let's hear your last pick courtney all right here we go so and sort of speaking of that notion of narrative device my film has a character that's created not of the elite echelon but is trying to navigate that world and the film i picked for my second nomination is a brilliant little french film called ridicule directed by patrice leconte in 1996. it earned over 20 million dollars worldwide and was nominated for best foreign language film by the american academy awards and it won the bafta the French version of the Oscars, known as the César, garnered the movie Best Film, Best Director, as well as Best Costume and Art Direction. Now, this is a film that might easily be overlooked at first glance because of its focus on the pursuit of social climbing in the 18th century French royal court at the Palace of Versailles. And that certainly is a key part of the plot. 
making for some hilarious scenes between competing aristocrats as they vie for power and constantly undercut one another. And to be fair, today's social media may have a lot more in common with 18th century court life than we imagine, where wit is supreme and ridicule can get you canceled. Ooh. Right? Nice. However, what is most surprising is that ridicule offers an overview of how the ideas of the Enlightenment and its practical application to real world problems is effortlessly intertwined with the main plot. The film follows the journey of the kind-hearted and enlightened Baron Grégoire, a financially strapped minor nobleman slash engineer who wants to save his village from disease by asking the king to fund his ambitious swamp drainage project. Gregoire naively believes that if he puts forth his appeal with enlightened logic and reason that the king will surely approve. However, he finds that he must instead insinuate himself into the snake pit of court life in order to have a chance of seeing the king at all. Along the way, he is befriended by the Marquis de Bellegarde, who serves as a mentor to our hero. The old doctor knows the protocols everyone must follow to achieve an audience with the king, and he advises Grégoire to be witty, sharp and malicious, and never ever laugh at your own jokes. Once at court, our hero soon realizes that being a witty wordsmith is key to climbing the social ladder, and he is seduced by one of the king's favorites, a widowed countess, who promises to help him, played by the brilliant actress Fanny Ardant. That alone is worth seeing the film. Of course, Gregoire also falls in love with his mentor, Bellegarde's daughter, who is a fellow science lover, and they collaborate on several experiments representing the themes of the Enlightenment throughout the film, including Gregoire's own hydraulic project to drain the swamps, Bellegarde's private library of books, including some of the banned authors at that time, like Voltaire. Experiments to test amateur underwater diving gear because you want to gather plant samples from the bottom of the river. And openly supporting Bellegarde's deaf son, who learns sign language from the real-life Charles-Michel de l'Epée. And the ingenious gathering of pollen from the royal gardens with a specially designed ladies' skirt hem. Now, taking place in 1783, during the reign of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, six short years before the French Revolution, Ridicule is one of those rare historical films that spotlights the social behavior of the era, while also acknowledging to the modern viewer that this is a world about to devour itself. The nobles are trapped in their increasingly limited world of social assassination, while we know that exile or the guillotine awaits them all. <laughs> In the end, Gregoire himself is a victim of ridicule, and he flees the royal court with his true love back to his country estate where, we are told, they survived the French Revolution and successfully drained the swamps themselves. Oh, of course. <laughs> Happy right? ending. And I think the swamps are also supposed to be a metaphor for the aristocracy being corrupt, uh, you know, and being like the swamp of court. And he's draining the swamps in both areas. That sounds really interesting. I'd never heard of this movie before. But, but why would you? But now I want to <laughs> give it a shot. What do you think makes this so much better about the Enlightenment than maybe other movies or shows. Is this, it, does it show like, you know, the things we, ha the ridiculous lengths we have to go through to get the attention of those in power in this yes, period? Yes, absolutely. Or is it more like the literal Enlightenment learning and, and projects that they're all encountering and, and, and doing, the swamp drainage, the sign language, uh, the banned authors, that sort of thing? Well, I think what's interesting is that the film's sort of juxtaposing the two worlds, this weird, insular social hierarchy of aristocracy, and that all power emanates from the king in an absolutist regime. And your closeness to the king denotes how much power you have. And in order to get close to the king, you need to become one of his favorites and be witty and entertain him and make sure he feels like you're on his side. So navigating that world, people who are in that place don't want to let you in, right? So they, they're constantly putting you down and limiting your access to the king. So in a way, the film demonstrates all the foibles of this sort of social machinations of keeping yourself close to the king and their ignorance and unwillingness to even take a, a look outside the castle walls to understand what's really going on in the world around them that's going to lead to the French Revolution. And then our minor characters, again, who are not of the elite class, right? They're still nobles, but they're minor nobles. They live in the country estates. They don't have access to power. They're the ones actually trying to implement these ideas of the Enlightenment and bring it to the fore. So the film in this way depicts those two tracks. And I think in terms of 
the film's viability, what's nice about it is from a student standpoint, right, if you're going to have students watch it, there's all these different ways in to decode what's happening in the pre-revolutionary era. I, I'm really glad you picked this one. I'd never heard of it either. I'm glad you picked this one because it's a foreign film. And it's mm. actually, I think, the only um, foreign film, foreign language film, certainly, um, on, on this list. And we've kind of talked about this already and what Hollywood's taste in film is like. And that can actually be really limiting uh, because I, I really struggle to think of a good American film that deals with the Enlightenment. I, I, and I'm just curious, can, do, can you think of any? Do you know any? Well, I think, I think the American Enlightenment is interesting because it's really intertwined with our founding fathers and the creation of America as a republic and the writing of the Constitution. I mean, the, the, the one that's known by everybody is, what does Ben Franklin do? Traps lightning with his kite, right? The whole right. The mystique of that and the myth of that. And Ben Franklin really sort of represents the Enlightenment in an American context the best and is probably most accessible. But I really think that because our notion of intellectual enlightenment is really tied uh, with it, I think uh, with the American Revolution. Um, That's a really good point. Really Other good point. than the revolution and Ben Franklin, you really have to start digging you're like, who is another Enlightenment figure in the U.S. <laughs> that's like not associated yeah. with either of those? Right, and there are plenty. We just don't we hear just their don't stories. We don't yeah. hear their stories. Right. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about narrowing the field here from a bit. And I'm going to start out, Bob, I'm sorry, but we're going to cut Rome because it is not a modern historical That's okay. Uh, it's my sacrificial lamb. It's really fun, though. I appreciate it the, I appreciated the, uh, the offering. It comes with all the recommendations. Right. <laughs> so that one's down. I do really like your other, your other pick of 13 Days, though, and I, I believe that deserves to be in there. It's not just uh, an amazing depiction of a very complicated world event, but it does so with a lot of action. Accuracy. Absolutely, I agree. I think that definitely has to be in the top mix. And Andy, I think Master and Commander would be my pick of your two for sure. Really? Absolutely. Over Apollo 13? You know, I think Apollo 13 is great, but it depicts sort of a narrow, specific event. Whereas Master and Commander, I think, brings you into a world that you never would have had access to otherwise. I think it's accessible to all audiences. And you learn so much stuff from watching it about uh, the sea and what it was like to be in the Navy um, and all the different things that uh, went on in the movie. You definitely learn a lot more about everyday people in that time period. Yeah, it, and I like that that point that, you know, you can come into Master and Commander knowing nothing or knowing a lot about the Napoleonic Wars, but you don't know this story because it's <laughs> fiction, but you'll learn a lot. Of, I, I like that point, yeah, yeah. I like it a lot. So, uh, Courtney, for yours, uh, 1917 versus versus ridicule. I, personally, I, I love 1917. I, I think we we really uh, do owe World War One some more uh, pride of place I in agree. our popular oh, I culture. Love that. Um, and you know, the, the the cinematography in that movie, I think, just as a work of art, is is truly mesmerizing to watch. So, I'm a I'm a contender for for 1917. Although I will definitely check out ridicule. Yeah, for sure, yeah. for yeah. sure. And um, I have a DVD if you want to borrow it. I it's might. hard to find. I might. But I would say. <laughs> that um, 1917 would be my pick as well. I just think it's amazing. And for all the reasons you just stated, Bob, I think it's important for all of us to understand World War I and, and its place. And it's just beautiful. I think it's interesting to note here that we have picked one finalist for accuracy of events and character, and two that are more accuracy of period, of evoking in detail rather than in actual story and event. I don't know what that exactly tells us, but it is, it is. I guess, in my mind, it's worthy of, you can tell interesting narrative stories without sacrificing the history. Absolutely. In ways. You, you just have to build a bunch of very expensive sets. Right. And I also think a lot of people <laughs> should see 13 Days, because I think it's amazing and really informative. So I hope more people, as a result of listening to our podcast, take a look at it. Okay, so before we break for the day, I'd like to ask, were there any honorary mentions? Were there any any other films that deserve attention but didn't make the cut for you guys? Two that I really thought of uh, were, were Imitation Game. Uh, that's the movie that came out a few years ago about Alan Turing um, and the uh, the breaking of the Enigma Code. So, again, a movie that takes a lot of liberties, uh, makes a lot of dramatizations, but also a very interesting uh, very interesting story. Um, and then I also like The Last Emperor, which is about yes. the, uh, the last uh, emperor of the Qin Dynasty. It was actually based on that guy's autobiography, so mm. very interesting. Um, and accurate in that sense. Again, takes some liberties, uh, but shows kind of this very interesting transition because he's a guy who really uh, lives through this whole 
pivotal turbulent time in Chinese oh, history. Yeah. He starts, he is born an emperor, uh, and you know dies as a street sweeper in the People's Republic of China. Right. Yeah. So, uh, very interesting movie. Great pick, and I, you know, Bernardo Bertolucci just makes the whole film feel um, so poignant as you're watching this young person grow up and then having to deal with all these changes across history. Um, you know, I have to say, a, f- a fun one for me would be A Knight's Tale. Oh, right? oh there it yeah. is. Right? Like, <laughs> we okay. will rock you. And here, yeah, we will rock you. But here's the thing. It is a fun frolic of a film. Absolutely. But what's surprising is that there's a lot of historical accuracies woven throughout. Lots of little details that are absolutely spot on that uh, feel fresh and new in this particularly sort of anachronistic take on what it means to become a knight during the medieval period. But uh, it's certainly a lot of fun. And, you know, one of Heath Ledger's films... You know who's no longer with us, and, and he does a great job with it. I, I, I gotta interrupt. I, I can't tell you how many how many scholars I've read or listened to who are like, oh, I hate that movie. But medieval <laughs> scholars who love that movie. Yes, yes, <laughs> and with good reason because there's not a lot of good medieval films out there. <laughs> no, um, unless you're watching Lion in Winter or The, the Return of Martin Gare, <laughs> <laughs> which nobody sees. Um, but my second choice would be um, for a nomination would follow in Bob's footsteps, and it's a miniseries. And I think yeah. the John Adams miniseries based on David McCullough's book. Who was also an advisor on the set was oh, really yeah. terrific, and I especially appreciated it for its portrayal of Adam's wife Abigail and the journey of their daughter Nabby dealing with breast cancer. And I just think those are stories that are um, wonderfully told in this particular. I media. loved that series. I really liked Paul Giamatti as as John Adams. I liked all the casting in it. They, that was fantastic. So for mine, I actually I have a series as well, and it's the Black Adder series. Yeah, um, great series. specifically <laughs> to keep with the modern history theme, it's season five, which is also my favorite. And if you've never seen it, Black Adder is basically they take four of the same characters in like a bunch of different time periods of English history, and it's Black Adder, the conniving nobleman in you know medieval England. By the time you get to uh, season five, it's in World War One, and he is an infantry commander. His best friend is Hugh Laurie, who is this total bop of another officer. But it's the it's the British experience of World War One, and it's an amazing series. And it's and a comedy series. It's Rowan Atkinson, who's yeah. Mr. Bean most Mr. to most Bean. people, but like he's phenomenal in this. I love it. And this Stephen game. Fry's in it, oh, and there's so many big names. Such a great cast. Uh, the other one I would nominate is a foreign film, and it is the 1994 Chinese drama To Live, which I saw as a student here taking an East Asian history course, and it's about a man and his family living through the Chinese Revolution, World War II, and then the Communist Revolution. Revolution, all the way up to the uh, the Cultural Revolution part, and it is a very moving film that uh, I think captures. It's a fictitious tale of a, of the family, but it definitely captures the you know the the accuracy and the detail and the period. That's fantastic. Uh, it'll make you cry, but it's a great movie. I'm definitely going to watch that. I think that'd be interesting to juxtapose that with The Last Emperor. Yeah, that's fabulous. I, I never heard of that, and I will definitely check that one out. So that wraps it up for us. You heard our top three, our 13 days. Master and Commander, and 1917. While there's plenty more to debate on this topic, there's plenty more movies to talk about. We're going to save that for a round of beers. We hope we have inspired you to discuss some of these historical events and films yourself, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on today's topics. So from all of us here at the Naval Academy, thanks for tuning in to the Top 3. This has been a production of the History Department at the U.S. Naval Academy, located in Annapolis, Maryland. If you enjoy our programs, please let us know as we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at USNA History, and our email is historyproductions-group at usna.edu. For more information about the History Department at the Naval Academy, please visit usna.edu history.